Well, good morning. Special welcome to any visitors. I love visitors. Love having you here. If you've come to worship with us at Southside Bible Church, I pray you will be encouraged as we worship the living God now through the Word of God. We believe that uh, it's, uh, the preaching and teaching of God's Word is worship. It doesn't end now. It continues as we worship God through His Word. We are having a good season in the Word of God. If you'll turn to First Peter, we're staring in the glories and the beauties of the gospel in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 1. This is our 12th sermon in Peter this morning, and it's just been a beautiful view to slow down and look at His matchless grace, just adoring what we have in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us in this gospel. So we saw last week that this grace has come to us. It has come in the form of a person. It's come in the Lord Jesus Christ. We live now in the time of fulfillment of all the promises and all the prophecies in the Old Testament of the grace that would come to us. And now we see and we behold things that the saints of old, they just longed for, and they made careful search and inquiry into who is this person. And so I pray and hope this morning that we will lay hold of these great truths. And in the midst of every trial and tribulation that the men just saying about that we have brought in here this morning. I've already talked with just a few saints who have walked in here this morning carrying some really heavy trials uh, that are distressing to them. But this morning, I desire that we would add to that distress that in this, we greatly rejoice in such a way that our burdens could become light and momentary as they're placed in the context of salvation history. Our experience in the furnace will directly correlate to our grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that is my prayer for the saints of God this morning. I pray that God would give us eyes to open the eyes of our heart, Lord, to see the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. And for this, let us join our hearts together and go to the throne of grace and ask God to meet us here in worship. Father, we come before you, and as Ron just shared, we see how hard and how difficult this journey to glory can become, but it seems like the, the more you squeeze grapes, the sweeter the wine that comes out for the one who has laid hold of this gospel. Father, this gospel causes us to, when we go in the furnace by your grace, to bear a, a, a refined gold, to, to be a sweet wine and fragrance and aroma of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I'm praying that you would comfort every heart this morning with that gospel. Lord, that every trial would be uh, undergird with the truth of what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. So I pray by your word, through your spirit, Lord, that you will minister to every heart in here. God, individually, you, you just, you are so amazing that you can deal individually with each, each heart in each life. And so we praise you for being God. We worship you that you are our Father. And so, Lord, attend the preaching of your word now. Let us worship you this morning as a saving God. To you be the glory, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Peter's writing to saints who are suffering and being persecuted greatly. It's about to increase exponentially under the fury of Nero toward the Christian church. They are dispersed abroad. Peter takes up the pen with the task of encouraging and strengthening these believers who are in what we'd call modern-day Turkey today to help them endure the sufferings that have come upon them and the ones that will be coming even in increased intensity. So where, where does Peter begin? Where would you begin to comfort? And he starts by reminding them in these first 12 verses of the gospel of our salvation to look at their, their current lives and the circumstances and the situations that have come so hotly upon them <clears throat> and to gird up <coughs> their minds in verse 13, to have sober thinking and hope in the coming to you grace of God, to think about their suffering, and not in light of the scene. You can't look at just the scene and, and, and understand and comprehend what God is doing in your life, but you must come to the unseen God who is moving his program uh, perfectly according to plan in your individual life, how you play in to that big picture of what God is doing in the history of this world. You have been brought into that by the grace of God. 
You're to look at your current trials and persecutions in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't just look at them with a natural eye. You can't just think about them in light of what is seen, or you will sink and you will be burnt to a cinder in that furnace. You must lift your eyes and look up to the God of all grace, the God of our salvation, the God of the most amazing salvation that we've been studying for the last 11 years. Weeks. That is the perspective that the believer must live their lives. Therefore, what we have seen is that this gospel, that in verse 9, it has brought about the salvation of your souls. Eternal salvation from the wrath of God. There's been a deliverance, a rescue. You have been redeemed. And Paul, Peter says you have an eternal inheritance waiting for you, brothers and sisters, one that is safeguarded by God himself, and you are protected by the power of God from now till glory. And the instrument that God uses, he says in verse 5, is your faith, a faith that was given to you by God. Faith is a gift. Uh, It's a faith that has been purified and deepened by individually hand-picked trials to keep refining and purifying that faith, which is more precious than gold. If you had perfect gold that you could live on with all the monies and the riches of that purified gold, it is nothing compared to purified faith that will obtain the salvation of your souls when this life is over. A faith that must be made pure. Unbelief must be boiled out The impurities of our faith must be put in the fire if necessary, Peter says, and that if necessary is according to God himself. He knows what furnace, when, how long we submit to that perfect hand of God. So in verse 10, last week we took up, if you'll look with me at the beginning of verse 10, as to this salvation, the prophets uh, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. And so I couldn't get past the beauty of that phrase, and we just stopped and spent the whole Sunday on it, and I don't know as if I can really get past it this week. This is so beautiful and amazing. I just love these words, this salvation, this salvation, this, the one that God has made and prepared and done for all of us to have as a gift of His grace, the one that He has held out to us freely. This one that can bring comfort in the furnace to anything that you are facing this morning. This one that's caused me to be born again to a living hope. A hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It can't die. It's the one hope that you will get. The one hope that will satisfy. You have a living hope because of this gospel. This salvation. This one that will make me gird up my mind in verse 13. This one that will cause us to live in holiness and passion in the rest of this chapter that we will be studying. Yes, this salvation. This salvation is the one that we are looking at, studying, living in, treasuring, and loving as the believers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. There should be something hearty to that. Amen. You st- You said it like it's something small. Goodness. This salvation, that Christianity, it's not just a teaching that you take up. It's not just a moral code of conduct that you try to live. It's not to just believe that there is a God. It's not enough to just say there's a higher power. To come to the fact that uh, there's, it's not an evolutionary process. There must be a creator. The gospel is bigger than all of that. It's good news of glad tidings. It's a herald who comes into a town, and he comes to proclaim news of something that has happened in the history of this world that will affect your life. So heralds will come in, and they will declare major things in cities so you know there's a civil war going on and different things like that. No herald just would show up with moral teachings. He rides into town and says, I declare a penny saved is a penny earned. It's stupid. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's, it, it, it's not maxims. It's not teachings. Christianity, it's not that. It's a herald. And it's a herald saying something has happened in the history of this world, of this earth. And the history is that God has sent His Son into the world to be the Savior of it. It is this salvation that this world exists and that you exist this morning. 
This gospel is a call for those who will receive it, for those who will believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to wrap your very lives and souls around this gospel. The hymn writer put it, he said, this gospel demands my life, my soul, my all. This gospel takes up the whole person. This gospel is too magnificent to leave dead external orthodoxy. This takes up my life, my soul, my all. And Peter will tell us this gospel, it's so magnificent. It's so beautiful and glorious that it is worthy of my life. And the rest of this letter, that's what will be the response to this gospel. It demands my life, my soul, my all. This gospel is too big to sit on the side and look at it once a week. It's too glorious, too magnificent. No teaching can do that. Nothing can take up your heart, mind, soul, and strength to love the God of this gospel but this salvation. Guys, the gospel is good news. It's the best news. It's thrilling news. I pray you just can't get over this gospel, the salvation of your souls, the grace of God. 66 books with a common theme of the grace of Almighty God. The theme of this book is what God has done for our great and desperate need as rebellious sinners to God, and it is all of grace. The exact opposite response that our hearts and lives deserved, God should have destroyed us, and he gave us grace. He should have gave us wrath, and God gave us grace. And so this morning... I get the privilege to unfold Peter's argument as to how great this salvation is and why it should take up our hearts and make us sing in the fire and in the flood. And so I I pray, God, that you will meet us as we look at the greatness of this salvation, that every one of you would receive it by faith and that your hearts would soar no matter what you walked in here carrying and burdens and weights in your lives. So let's look at five reasons that Peter gives why this salvation is so beautiful. I'm actually going to just jump ahead. The first one is it's God's plan. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. Uh, Peter writes, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. You were redeemed with the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him you are believers in God, because God raised him up from the dead. And so this gospel, I want you to hear this, it's not new, it's not a quick response to a bad decision that Adam made in the garden. This gospel, we could say, is why this world exists. This world exists for God's glory, and the glory comes through this gospel. God desired to put on display all of His attributes and all of His glory in this plan of displaying His grace. He has a plan, and He's had this plan, I want you to hear this, from all of eternity. Even before He created, He had a purpose. The Lamb of God was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This salvation was in the mind and heart of God before He created anything. This whole glorious unfolding plan of grace was in the mind of God forever. And we saw in verse 2 that God chose you, uh, saints of God, and you were foreknown before the foundation of the world. Before he even created, he set his love upon you, believer in Christ. This was the eternal heart and plan of our God. We have been loved from eternity to be brought into this amazing salvation that I've been declaring these last weeks. And this will climax in His return with our souls being saved. And all that that entails, we're going to have eternity to seek that out and learn and grow and marvel in this forever. He's infinite. We're finite. We will grow in this forever and ever and ever. Look at verse 11. They were seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So the thousands of years before Christ walked this earth, the prophets, it says, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, are already declaring the sufferings of Jesus and the glories that will follow. 
And so this was planned and determined from everlasting. Jesus was pondering his cross back in eternity past. Back in the mind of God for your salvation, Jesus was already considering the cost, the price, what he would pay, and the glories that would follow with this bride that would be given to him. So you could say Jesus has loved you with a dying love from all of eternity. I believe you could meditate on that the rest of your lives and never get to the end of that statement. Jesus has loved you with a dying love from all of eternity, the greatness, guys, of our salvation. Secondly, why this salvation is so great is that this gospel was prophesied and predicted. I want to begin reading in verse 10. I'll read 11 again as well. So as to this salvation that we looked at last week, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, they made careful search and inquiry, and they were seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Okay, so the Old Testament prophets, they prophesied about this salvation, this grace that was to come. And they would go and say, thus saith the Lord. So the Lord would communicate truth to them. They would write it down and they would herald it. They would proclaim it. And so I want you to understand this later they would look at these prophecies and these writings, and and they would make, it says, careful search and inquiry. This is really digging in, looking at it from every angle, pondering it, studying it. They would come back to these, their own writings, their own proclamations, and say, who is this person, and what time is the Spirit of Christ within me indicating and telling me about? which is why uh, we get our theology that the Scriptures are inspired by God. They are God-breathed. They said, we wrote what the Spirit of Christ told us to wrote, to write. So every word that you hold in your Bible is God-breathed. And that's why we declare it week in and week out and look at every nuance, every detail, every article, every verb, as these were all given to us by God to manifest His character in this great salvation that we are looking at. And in the next book that Peter wrote, he said, Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. You should tremble this morning. You hold the words of God in this Bible. Uh, Hopefully it's not a phone. You hold it in your Bibles. That's a side note. Then these prophets would study their own writings and others, and they would carefully search it and inquire about it. What person is the Spirit talking about? What time is this? What what are the sufferings and glories to follow? This is the promised Messiah that God has been promising, the one who would come and bring a worldwide revival, uh, one who would bring the Jews and the nations into a cosmic salvation. I'm not just dealing with the Jews. I am now taking this gospel to the nations. It would go to the very ends of the earth. And these prophets are, I want to understand this. I want to get this. It, it took up their minds and their hearts to understand this amazing salvation that they were writing about. Uh, from Genesis to Malachi, it gripped them. They were taken up with and they were fascinated with the promise of a coming salvation, the grace that would come to you. And from this, we can see that they did not understand the fullness of Christ. They saw it shadowy. It was shadowy to them, but they saw it, the believers. They were so amazed at it that they kept studying it out, saying, how can I understand this fuller and deep? And they they, they were taken up with it so to speak. And what was the Spirit of Christ predicting through these prophets? Well, two things, the sufferings of Christ. There were many passages in the Old Testament that predicted His sufferings. We see in the Gospels the prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled as Jesus tread the wine press on His way to Calvary and as He hung on that cross. Every time something happened, it says, as was prophesied, as, as was prophesied. All, every bit of His sufferings and details were predicted hundreds and even thousands of years before they took place. In Psalm 22, He cries out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me. And as Jesus was bearing the wrath of God on that cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Instead of going through the whole Bible, which would be fun, 
I want you just, I'm just going to pull out my favorite prophecy, and I want you just to listen to this 700 years before. Isaiah writes this, who's believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this person, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him, this one. But this one was despised and he was forsaken of men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was like one from whom men hide their face because of the atrocity of his beatings. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, the wrath of God being poured out on him. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, a cross. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Isaiah writes this, and now he goes and he makes careful search and inquiry. What is that talking about? Who and what is the Spirit of Christ revealing to us? It's shadowy. I can't really figure this whole thing out or understand it, but I can see enough of it. There's something beautiful going on here. So if, if you're here this morning, this is for free, and you're wondering about this good news this gospel that Christians are so crazy about, I want you to hear that prophecy that I just read was written 700 years before Jesus walked this earth and was put up on a cross and pierced through for our iniquities. Every historical document has proved it. It can't be wiped away. This salvation was planned, and I pray this morning that you would receive it and not fight the hand of of a beautiful God who has delivered such a salvation to us. And he didn't just predict his sufferings, he also predicted the glories that would follow. He predicted the triumph of Jesus Christ, that he would defeat the devil and he would conquer death. And on the third day, he would be raised again. So he would be given life again. The prophecy said, my Holy One shall not undergo decay. He's going to be raised from the dead. He won't stay in his tomb. And in Psalm 2, he's called the reigning king over the nations to rule with a rod of iron. In Isaiah 9, the government will be upon his shoulders. He's seated in victory. He's won, so he came and suffered. He didn't stay in the grave. It also predicted the glories of a resurrected Christ, victory, now dispensing his salvation, this great salvation to all the nations and to you individually here this morning, predicted prophesied, told about for thousands of years before it even came to pass. Oh my. I'm going to read one more passage. I'm going to read a few more passages, but this one is Jesus is resurrected, or he's dead, and the, these two disciples are walking down the road to Emmaus, and, the, and they're despairing over what's happened, and I want you to listen to something beautiful. The two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about all these things which had taken place, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus himself, approached and he began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they just stood still looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? This is crazy. You haven't seen, heard. This is all that the city's talking about. And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people. Yes, he was. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. There's that promise that they were looking for. We thought he might be our, our one. 
Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened, which he said he would rise on the third day. But also some among us were amazed at us. And when they were at the tomb early in the morning, they didn't find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen the vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory, the sufferings and the glory, and beginning with Moses? And listen to this, with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. And they say, were our hearts not burning within us? This was Jesus. And so Jesus comes and shows this whole Old Testament, the prophets and the law and everything has pointed to me. The only way, the hermeneutic that opens up your Bible is when you realize that it has all been pointing to him. And he goes and he shows them and the the sufferings and the glories that had to happen. This is a planned salvation. Nothing's out of control. This is what we have said. God has been telling you what happened. I walked this earth, Jesus said. I have been telling you, here's the fullness of salvation. It has come. Thirdly, what an amazing salvation. Thirdly, he's armed with salvation now to dispense to the nations. Now we we have a gospel that he says, I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted. I'm going to now take salvation now that I've conquered it all. The Spirit's been poured out in this dispensation, and I'm going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This gospel will now bring in Jew and Gentile, and all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be joined to him, and they will be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. So catch the argument Please, when these prophets wrote about Christ, they didn't understand it all the way. It was shadowy, and they searched and inquired and tried to understand it. And and what they could see, they believed. And like Abraham, it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed God, what he would do. But, But what they did do, they wanted to understand it so badly that they searched it out. They diligently studied their own writings to understand the beauty of this gospel. The faithful of Israel were waiting for the consolation of Israel. They were waiting for a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. There was Anna when when it all happened, and and she says, I was waiting for the redemption of Israel. We've been waiting. We've been praying. We've been looking for this day. I just want to read uh, uh, one picture here of Zacharias in Luke 1. Keep taking all this in. Uh, His father, Zacharias, now this is the father of John the Baptist, He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He couldn't speak, and now he's going to finally open up that mute tongue, and he's going to say this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us, and he's accomplished redemption for his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. And as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, I will bless you by grace, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, a salvation that we can draw near to God and serve him in this love relationship without the fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, John, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high, Jesus Christ, shall visit us. And he will shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, and he will guide our feet into the way of peace. My goodness. They were waiting for what they could not see and understand of what the Spirit of Christ was telling them would come. They were waiting for this great salvation. And so the point, don't miss the point, this salvation that was promised 
was so rich and amazing, even in its shadowy form, that the prophets studied and tried to understand its wonders. They sought it diligently, intensely, and zealously because it was so beautiful to them on the other side of the cross of Christ. Their drive was to understand this great salvation that God was prophesying. And we sit here on the other side of the cross in all of its fullness, and we tend to let it get stale. And so the the shame to all of us if we let this get stale and cold in the midst of our suffering and our trials and our journey to glory is that this gospel, fresh, alive in our hearts, is what is going to gird us up in the furnace. If the furnace is killing us and destroying us, it's because this great gospel is, we're not focusing on it. It's diminishing. It's becoming stale and not fresh and true in our hearts. Jesus said this, For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, him, and they didn't get to see it, and to hear what you hear, and they didn't get to hear it. Do you realize what we get to see and what we get to hear through the Word of God? We we get to see the fulfillment. We get to see all that prophecy fulfilled in Christ. We get it all, and that's the beauty. That will take me to my next point. Number three, number three. He tells us it was revealed in verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, the prophets. And so God reveals himself to like Isaiah in chapter 6. And and Isaiah gets that vision of God and he curses his own mouth. I'm, I'm unraveling. I've seen God. The tongs touch, removes his iniquity. And God says, who will go for us? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, here, here I am send me. And listen to what God says to the, to the missionary, the, the missionary who's volunteering to go preach this now. He said, go tell this people to keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on lis- looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and they return to the Lord and be healed. You're going to go preach, and this is going to harden them. They're not going to listen. They're going to be stiff-necked and rebellious. And I think Isaiah asked the question that every one of us should have asked. Lord, how long? How long do I keep preaching to people who aren't going to listen? I don't feel that way. Thank you. And the Lord answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth and an oak whose stump remains when it's felled. The holy seed is its lump. Isaiah, I have a, a remnant. I have a remnant in the midst of this rebellious Israel. And in this rebellious America, I, I have a remnant. And he's saying, keep preaching. Some, this is going to be the aroma of death and a death. You're going to hear these words and they're going to harden you and they're going to just keep rendering your hearts insensitive. And then others are going to believe and receive and have this great salvation become theirs. So this, this was a time of hardening for Israel. We had Jeremiah the weeping prophet and Isaiah and so on. Yet they were told, listen to this, that there's a day coming What you wrote about, prophets, is going to happen. A Messiah is going to come, and faith will rise among the nations. And they will call upon this great Messiah for salvation from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it's going to come. So you're not serving yourself, prophets. You're serving Southside Bible Church in 2017. You're going to be telling of the beauties and the sufferings of Christ and all the Old Testament and the glories that would follow. So maybe 700 years before they happened that someone today might be sitting here hearing and begin to marvel and say, who is this God? Who is the God that determines history and plans salvations and brings it to pass thousands of years before? You were serving them, not just yourselves. You're now in the day of salvation. You're in the day where those who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Hebrews 11, all these, the men of faith and women, 
having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. But because God had provided something better for us believers in the new covenant, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And so they were writing of these future days. They were just seeing hardenings in Israel and rebellion. And they're talking about a day when Messiah would come and the nations would start falling down and receiving and believing upon Christ. How glorious is this gospel? Fourthly, in these things, he says in verse 12, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And so now we're looking at the fulfillment. Jesus came and fulfilled every prophecy. He fulfilled the whole law by being perfect righteousness, by being the sacrifice for sin. Jesus came and fulfilled all of it so that preachers now like Paul and the apostles and Whitfields and Luthers and Edwards and Spurgeons and MacArthur's and Pipers and little old grandmothers and no-name pastors and, and friends would, would come to you now and declare the gospel that's been planned from the foundation of the world, promised and prophesied, fulfilled in Christ, and they now come to you and say, in all of your sin and the wrath of God that's upon you, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. There's a Savior who, who was promised and came into this world and did exactly what God said He would do. And He, he accomplished salvation. It's finished. And so now, 2017, that it would be lifted up and any who look and believe and repent and call on this name can be saved. This gospel happened. The Son of God really came into this world. He really lived out the true righteousness on our behalf, the righteousness God wants. He really lived it. He really fulfilled all the righteousness that the law required. He really did become guilty of our sin and get put up on a cross, and God pierced him through for our transgressions. He really breathed his last. He was, bo he was put in a real tomb. And he really, on the third day, was raised in victory. And he really ascended into heaven, and he's really right now seated at the right hand of God, overseeing his church. And he really did pour out his Holy Spirit upon the church at Pentecost for this season now of the ingathering of the nations. It's why we exist. It's why we exist. I just saw one of my brothers who gets up every Sunday morning and goes to the prison and pleads with people to come to Jesus Christ. It's why we exist, to go and take this message the Spirit is now doing. He's fulfilling that, that the nations would come in through this glorious message that was planned before the foundation of the world and prophesied and really happened in history. He really did accomplish this great salvation. It has now taken up the hearts of New Testament believers. The one writing this was taken up so much with this that he would, he, he would not renounce his love for Jesus any longer. He, he denied him. God restored him. The spirits poured out. And now Peter would not renounce this name of Jesus for anything, so much so that under Nero, he went to a cross. And as he went to the cross, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord. And Peter is crucified upside down for the name that is above every name. The one that he watched die, the one that he ate fish with in his resurrected body, the one that he saw ascended up into heaven is so real true that I will go hang upside down on a cross for this name, my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Love so amazing so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. This gospel is so amazing that it's got to take up all of you. It takes up the whole being, the whole person. If it's just some moral teaching, you'll just be legalist and mean and nasty till you die. But if this gospel gets you, it takes up the whole being. And now I love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. Why would anyone reject this? Please hear this morning what Peter is saying. The great value of this salvation is brought to you now by preachers and preachers who have been sent from God. 
ambassadors for Jesus Christ, entreating you and begging you to be reconciled to God. God sends them to you now with the great gospel message of salvation. And this morning, I am that person, and I've prayed for you this week. I preach by the Holy Spirit what God has done, that the grace of God has come near to save sinners. He is here, and He is speaking His gospel to you through a weak instrument, asking you to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's God himself asking you to stop rebelling and saying another day, being moral, putting it off. God himself is asking you this morning to stop. I've brought about salvation. Call upon this name and be saved. Will you respond to the kindness and the grace of your creator this morning and sending his son to do this? Will you quit fighting him and lay your armor down and bow to the Lord Jesus Christ? The cry of my heart is that not one person in this room will stand before God and say, "Uh uh-oh, when you see how holy this God is, your good works and all these things that you're resting in this, this morning will be burned up instantly. And this salvation is offered to you. The grace of God has come near. It's offered to the one who will not work for it. The one who's been convicted by the Holy Spirit of your sin and how heinous it is before this God and that it's your nature and you can't weed it out or fix it. And he's convicted you that you're going to stand before God in judgment and that he demands a perfect Righteousness to be in his presence. To this one, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Call upon him. He's come near and he's preaching to you through me this morning, asking, will you come? Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest for your soul. Forget me. Listen to God entreating you. I gave you salvation. It's here. Preachers are telling you now it's come Come, come, believe, receive, and be saved. I pray that you would be done with lesser things and give heart and mind and soul and voice to serve the King of Kings. And my last point, the fifth thing of why this gospel is so amazing is right at the end of verse 12. Things into which angels long to look. Raise your hand if you ever thought about being an angel. Yeah, I see you. All right. Could you imagine you get to fly around in glory? You get to be good all the time. Uh, You get to be in the presence of God. It's so cool. When I was a kid, I used to lay there looking up at the clouds and just picturing what it would be like to be an angel. Isn't that kind of weird? I wasn't even a believer, and God was already kind of starting my mind thinking about that. But do you realize that angels do the same thing? They marvel at what it would be like to be us. What would it be like to receive the grace of God? of God. Fallen angels, for sure, because they can never be redeemed from their fallenness. They're consigned to the pit of hell. They'll never be able to come out. Heavenly angels are the ones I believe he's talking about in this passage. And these ones, the the angels in heaven, it says they long to look at this great salvation that I've been declaring to you. It's, it's a beautiful Greek word. We've talked about it several times in different books. And James, when it talked about sin, it says you're tempted and drawn away by sin. And that Greek word was epithumeo, epithumia. And so an, a, a thumia is a desire. It, 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 to have a desire, it can be for good things and it can be for bad things. And you put epi on the front of it and it means an over-desire. So what sin is, it's an over-desire for something. It could be, I I just want a a good family. And it becomes such a desire that my whole identity and life is built into this good family that it becomes sin. You know, I I just want to, you know, there's a hundred different things that could be good and there's a lot of things that could be bad, but what it is is it's an epithumia. 
You have an over-desire instead of it being for God. And in God, Peter picks that word right here. Angels have an epithumia to look into this salvation that God has done. It's a passion. It's an impulse that cannot be satisfied. They have epithumia so longing and desiring. What is this gospel of grace that you guys have received? Peter pulls it out and says the angels have this. They got an epithumia to look at your grace. They're straining themselves to look at what God is doing on earth toward fallen sinners. This gospel is amazing to them. It's the same verb when Peter and John looked into the tomb to see if Jesus was in there. It is an amazing desire to look and to see. And so get this, that angels who are always in the presence and glory of God are looking at this salvation and it's a present tense verb, they just keep looking. They, they can't look away from it. It's taken up all of their being is, what is this grace of God that has come? I want to understand it. I, I want to get it a little deeper, a better understanding of it. Well, why? Because the salvation of man eclipses everything that God has ever done. They're, so they're there at creation. They, they see the great actions of God, parting Red Seas. They, they've seen so many things, these angels. But it's this salvation that they can't get enough of. It's the salvation that they can't fathom it. They desire to see it. This might be uh, irreligious, but they might be leaning over the banister of heaven just watching sinners get saved. Every baptism, the ones who just got baptized, can you picture the angels looking down saying, wow. Look at another one. It says that every time a sinner repents and believes, they celebrate in heaven. And so they, they love this gospel. They, they love seeing sinners get saved. Ephesians 3.10, uh, in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, that the church would show the glory of a reconciled family under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And the angels just, they, they're celebrating. They love this. They delight in this. Look at this gospel. Look at him, the son of God incarnated, the creator of this earth hanging on a cross, dying. Why? 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 The answer staggers the angels. The one they've worshipped in glory, hanging on a cross, bowing his head with this whole world, hating him, mocking, spitting, rejecting. What is this? They're amazed. And so the application is simple. If angels are amazed at this, are you? Have you gotten over the wondrous cross? What does it mean to you this morning? Does it amaze you and astonish you? It's my theme now and it will be in glory. Have you jumped into the wonders and the beauties of this gospel? God, awaken us again to the greatness of this salvation. The proof of remaining sin is that something this amazing could ever get familiar, cold, or rote? Shame on us. And I pray for you in the furnace. Look again at the greatness of this salvation of what God has laid up for you. Don't let the furnace boil away this gospel from your minds and your heart and your hope. May our afflictions burn this gospel brighter and clearer into our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for trials so we don't make our home here and we live as aliens who have been chosen by God. To him be the glory both forever and now. Amen. Come see me afterwards if you need to be saved, please. I'll be standing up front with some other elders. This gospel is too beautiful to keep putting away and ignoring. May God add to his kingdom this morning, I pray. Father, we thank you for the glories of this gospel. I thank you for the prophets who were so taken up by it. I thank you um, that they just couldn't get enough trying to figure out what is this. This is amazing. 
What, what could it be? Who is this person? When is it going to happen? Oh, God, thank you for what they, they wrote by your Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the, the glories of our, our Old Testament that predicted His sufferings and His glory. Hundreds and thousands of years, God, thank you for the picture of salvation that you have painted in this Old Testament. It just brings it alive and makes it beautiful. Lord, thank you. Thank you again for a salvation that you planned in your heart and you had these prophets and, and men and women proclaim and declare these great truths. But I want to thank you that eternity stepped into time and that the one they predicted and prophesied, the one who knew every cost that it would take to bring about salvation, stepped into a virgin's womb and was born into this world. And he really lived on this earth. And he really was a carpenter. And he really lived a perfect life. We see it in the Gospels. It's beautiful. And the Son of God who created this world really did hang on a cross in our place. Nothing else can explain that. God, thank you for that salvation. Thank you that he's risen. Thank you that now your spirit has been poured out on the church and that now you send men, women, and children to declare to any who come into our presence that this salvation, this salvation can be theirs. God, if they will repent and believe upon the name of the one that you have sent. And so, Lord, let that salvation buttress us in our, in our trials. It's so gorgeous and beautiful and amazing. It does demand my life, my soul, my all. Lord, let us be taken up by it more than the trial that we're facing. God, let every heart be comforted here this morning in this gospel. And if there's any unbelievers, God, by your spirit, let them hear you entreating them to come find life, to come find forgiveness of their sins and separation from God and the wrath that is abiding upon their life this very moment. Oh, God, give them eyes to see and ears to hear, and let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, in the name of that sweet Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.